What's up, everybody? It's Reggie Williams, founder and CEO of Ambrosia for Heads. And with me, I have Jake Payne, our editor in chief. And together, this is our What's the Headline podcast. How you doing, man? Yeah, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I think we are in a great spot with these podcasts. Uh, I think two weeks off, right? Or is it three? Yeah. Two. Yeah. Last one was Juneteenth. Absolutely. And um, we always have a reason to speak. And we really are trying to take the feedback we're getting, a lot of the, the, the praises, and make sure that we come with it. You know, word to flip mode squad. So, I, you, man, you hit me midweek and you're like, I got something. And, and here we are. Yeah, man, for sure. I mean, for those that don't know, Ambrosia for Heads uh, has meaning. It's, a, it's more than a mouthful. Uh, pause. Uh, <laughs> hey, <you. laughs> um, Ambrosia is Greek for food of the gods. And so we always strive to deliver quality for heads, you know. And so if there's not a lot out there, we're, we're just not going to fill the space. We always want to wait for the filet mignon, as Jake would say, for the, for the good stuff. So um, we got some great stuff, actually, courtesy of Ice Cube. Ice Cube was in the news earlier this week. He had very, very high praise for a certain MC that he, he determined was the GOAT. Now, for a lot of people, myself included, Ice Cube is one of those GOATs. Um, I always talk about the notion of first favorite MCs. And actually, and so what that means for me is, who was your first favorite MC? Because I think that answer changes over time and you know, what's the answer of that for you tupac tupac your first favorite mc yeah i mean you know it's funny before i ever had all eyes on me which was my first tupac purchase i had heard you know different stuff on the radio but i was it dropped a month after my 12th birthday that album before that dropped i had, had stuff by tribe called quest and you know you're um you're you're kind of like pop rap of the early 90s um you know rest of development diggable planets us3 like the stuff and i had a lot of singles but Pac, when i fell in love with hip-hop it was around 95 96 and Pac was the person that really was like that first figurehead for me of what a, a true rap star hip-hop star could be Word. What, about, what about you though for me it was grandmaster melly mel you know, uh, The Message and Beat Street and um, Survivor and, you know, all the uh, survival, all those songs that Grandmaster Flash and Furious 5 could put out in the early 80s. But next up was LL Cool J, that breakout performance in Crush Groove. He was just a superstar for me. Then it was Big Daddy Kane. And next up was Ice Cube. I thought Ice Cube was incredible. I really love that West Coast sound. Still probably my favorite sound to date, you know, mm. old and new. On the production tip. Uh, production tip, but also like lyrically too, you know. Um, the, the cadence was was slower, uh, a little bit less dense than East Coast. I'm from Midwest and so, you know, was agnostic as to region. So that style really gravitated to me. And so Q, you know, just everything he's done from the NWA stuff to... Um, his own solo stuff has always been one of my favorites. So for him to talk about who his goat is was meaningful to me. And it was also really surprising because the person he named is someone I have tremendous respect for, but I got to say has never been like in top 10 for me in terms of like personal favorites, probably not even top 20. And that was Lil Wayne. He said that Lil Wayne besides himself was the greatest MC of all time, which that is like just insane, especially from Cube. And I remember back in, I think it was 2007, 2008, when Wayne was running the world, dropped the album, um, the Carter Three that did a million uh, units in one week back when people were still buying albums. And MTV named him the hottest MC um, of the year. You remember that? Yeah, uh, sure do. So, you know, what, what do you think of, of Cube saying this, first of all? Well, it's interesting. I didn't see it coming from Cube. And oftentimes these lists um, can be a little biased or a little skewed. And the interesting thing is Cube has never worked with Wayne. I mean, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if a year from now with Cube does a single or another rollout, if we see that collaboration. But I think this one was really organic and sincere. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, Cube is one of those you know, figureheads of West Coast rap, um, you know, obviously worked with the Bomb Squad and Public Enemy when he made America's Most. So he's always been an advocate of East Coast hip hop, but he's never been, you know, he did stuff with Face, Scarface, but, and Willie D and Ghetto Boys, but to see him choose an artist like Wayne that 
is kind of in another um, Venn diagram. Rap's totally different than Cube, you know, with the, with the, when Wayne is, I think, at his most lethal as a lyricist, that fast flow and crazy punchlines and all of that, it really did surprise me. This one, and, and the fact too, that it's 2022. If you would have asked Cube in this, and like you just said, in 2007, 2006, 2008, um, even then it's a more likely answer. But as much as I admire little Wayne and I agree with you, I don't know that Wayne's making my top 20, um, but I hold him in a high regard. I don't think Wayne's most lyrical stuff has necessarily happened in the last um, five years. There's been a few moments and we've covered them on the site, but he's not in Carter two, Carter three mode. Yeah. You hit on some reasons why I thought it was surprising. You know, typically when you got a guy like cube, who's a legend like that, their favorites are people that preceded them, people who influenced them, people who, you know, they built their style around. And so it was surprising for me to, for, for, or, or else maybe a contemporary that they found to be a competitor who like, you know, makes them better. So it was surprising to me for him to find someone who was, you know, 10 years or so like past cubes, uh, like um, uh, I'd say his like uh, peak in terms of commercial music. Um, and also just like you said, such a different style, but here's what he said about Wayne. He said, it's hard to beat Lil Wayne. It's just hard. Lil Wayne, I just think he is great. His metaphors are otherworldly. He's just an amazing talent. He's the best as far as lyrics and can make hits and has been copied. All these dudes are nothing but clones of Lil Wayne at the end of the day. I just think he is the best rapper of all time besides myself. I've done so much for the culture. Yeah, he's dope. I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy. So in, in, in doing this story, I started thinking about, you know, last time we did a podcast, we did, I won't say a response, but some commentary on the very controversial Rolling Stone top 200 list of rap albums of all time. And we set forth what the people, you know, millions of people determined in an AFH contest we had held for quite some time. We talked about the notion of lists and the importance they play in rap culture. So, um, you know, beyond even greatest albums of all time, I think the biggest argument, debate, discussion, however you want to frame it in hip hop is who's the greatest MC of all time. And in that top five has become kind of the framework that people use. Um, you know, who's your top five is fodder for barbershop discussion. There are artists like Jadakiss who declare themselves top five dead or alive and so forth. It's great to hear what the fans think, but we found over the years that when an MC declares his or her top five, it gets people's attention. So uh, I thought, what if we were to talk about the top fives or the greatest MCs of the greatest MCs of all time? And so that's what we're gonna do today. I'm super excited about that, but you know, let's start out by talking about the significance of top five lists. Um, how do top five lists differ than say, you know, these album lists that come out. Yeah, I mean, just in its in its lexicon, top five feels subjective. Like, and it's in, in a way, it's like asking your DNA, you know? And I, I'm curious too of your thoughts. Like, does the top five MCs discussion, is that an extension of, of like ball players or boxers? Like, where was the original top five discussion, you know? Like where in where in popular culture did people start doing that? Do you have any estimation? That's a great question. I do think it's probably a barbershop discussion, you know, or a sitting on the porch on the stoop or where, wherever your locale is discussion where, you know, people just looking for debate, you know, and it's something that can never, ever be, you know, decided finally, because like you said, it is very uh, subjective and very personal. I think a lot of times, you know, for me and even for these artists, as we dig into this, it's something that can change. You know, uh, my top five today might be very different than it was five years ago and five years from now and so forth. So it's an ongoing conversation. And I think it's just entertainment. Yeah. And that's a really good point. I mean, some of the artists that we're going to, you know, go off of today and, and we're going to do a, an on-site component with links to where they said it. But those lists have changed, you know, even among the goats themselves. And I know for me, mine does. And if, you know, especially when you get to that fifth spot or that fourth spot, if I go on a road trip and I take a certain album with me that's of a contender, or I spend a lot of 2022 listening to this artist, or they put out, 
you know, a really high profile album, that's going to influence your list, possibly. And I know there's folks out there that their top five is written in stone and they will die with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's what makes it such an interesting idea. Even though I'll, I'll say this, though, it's not something I've ever liked asking artists. Um, just being a 20 year journalist, there was a period of time in the, about 10, 15 years ago where that was the thing that everyone was asking. Because if nothing else, you could get a headline out of that. You know, XYZ MC gives their top five without any follow-up questions, without any fandom or discussion as to why or when, how it happened. And I got really upset at that. And I know there were times in my life where um, places I've worked and publications that I contributed to, I just refused to ask the question. I'd much rather talk about, um, you know, have have it happen organically of somebody talking about you know their influences but when you stand back and you see a cube credit a little wayne or you see some of these artists um really kind of lay out their dna which could be an artist that comes after them could be a contemporary could be a predecessor it gets really interesting and just as you and i have texted about this lately um i do think this discussion is super warranted yeah, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, others did ask those questions back in the day. Otherwise, <laughs> we wouldn't have anything to talk about today. Word. Uh, but let me ask you one more question before we dive in. Um, you know, so it's different depending on what the category is. I think for albums, people tend to skew top 10, uh, maybe even top 20 as, you know, time is going on. Why do you think five is the number for uh, MCs? it's just it's it's always gonna leave names out like you know 10 first of all like if you and i run a list of 10 i mean we might because we're present and we're very passionate about this but most people in a barbershop or in a bar and coffee shop they do that you're gonna you ask the person they're telling to run it back it's hard but five you know you can count it on on one hand ideally um but it it, it's you're always going to be challenged to fit it into a five and and the person next to you it's very hard to have that same list I, I just think it's it's good for discourse it's good for debate um it's the perfect number yeah yeah it's manageable you know i do think though that there's for a while a lot of people's lists were duplicative and felt obligatory to me and and actually kind of I'll say, um, I don't want to say dishonest, but a, a bit performative. Like, you know, it was always Nas, Jay-Z, Tupac, Biggie, and Eminem, maybe, you know, or, and the, the fifth one was always like, kind of like that variable. Yeah. Uh, and obviously those are all great MCs, but I can't believe that everyone in the world has that as their top five. Uh, so I've loved seeing those lists expand over the years. And, you know, I think what we talk about today is really going to showcase how much diversity there is. Absolutely. So, you know, before we get into it, I think it's really uh, important to note that while all these MCs are esteemed and established at this point, there was a time in their lives when they were just hungry, like, you know, artists. And even now that they're established, they're still very much fans of rap music. You know, I think people sometimes forget that even though these guys have done the things they do, that they're actually fans, they're students of the game. And, you know, one of the things I did early on, uh, I think even before you joined, was I did this video series called Where It All Began, where I interviewed like 20 different artists. All these videos are on our YouTube channel. Uh, subscribe if you like it, by the way. Um, it was everyone from D Jazzy Jeff to Merz to Kendrick to Big Daddy Kane, Sky Zoo, Freddie Gay Rock, Rhapsody, yeah. J Rock, Ab Soul, like, you know, school Schoolboy Q. Big Crit, like lots of people um, who are super dope, um, where I asked them the same five questions. Um, and one of them was, who was your first favorite MC? It was all about what stoked your love for hip hop. And it was awesome to see that. And, you, you know, that kind of question, you could see people just light up. And, you know, it could be like a five minute conversation just on that, because that's how much these these artists mean to the artists who were talking. So. Um, I think it's great to like dig into that as we do that, you know, and uh, so, so Cube, let's, let's talk about, so uh, first of all, let me hear who your, your top five is right now. Damn, today. Yeah. Uh, Tupac, I will always hold a spot on the list for Pac, um, Jay-Z, Kendrick Lamar, 
pasta noose plug one from de la soul am i allowed a tie or i gotta have a definitive fit uh i want to hear who your uh your tie is but then i want you to choose all right it's guru from Gangstar. oh wow okay that's not surprising and, for you and and it, it was a tie between guru and black dot i um yeah i just and, and obviously two very different mcs um, you know, ran in some of the same circles for a time. Uh, but yeah, that that's today. And I feel pretty good about this list. This list hasn't changed very much. Once in a while, I'll, there's an artist out there um, that's in that six, seven, eight slot that can move to the top if I spend a lot of time with their music. But I feel good about this one. What about Reggie? What's your list right now? It's so hard, man, because I think there's different criteria. You know, there's who do you like? And that for me could be very different versus who do you think is the, the illest, like in terms of lyricists, who's most influential and all those things. So I, I think that I'm gonna name, I'm not gonna like name any that fit each of those cat, any of those categories just you know by themselves. I'm gonna kind of blend it into like that top five. You don't wanna go sense. completely subjective. You don't wanna go completely subject I, you know what i'll give you i'll give you uh i'll give you both and this okay. is off the dome so um you know the blended i would say is black thought j tupac kendrick wow and uh and biggie damn okay that's blended that's, that's blended. we have four overlap on that that's crazy yeah. Uh, wait, did I say Andre 3000? You didn't. Who? <laughs> I'm going to have to take Kendrick out of there. You know, as much as I love Kendrick, this is Damn. the blended. This is the blended because okay. uh, I believe that Kendrick owes a lot of his style to Andre 3000. Mm -hmm. You go back and listen to Good Kid, Mad City, the harmonies, the layers, you know, the cadence. I think a lot of it is derivative of Andre. And so... Uh, you can't have um, the student without the teacher. So uh, you know, I put Andre in there as that top five. Now, subjective, personal top five. For me, it's Kendrick, LL, uh, Kane, Pac, and Q. It's hmm. a good list. It's original. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, let, let's 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 dive into it, man. Um, we got a very very extensive and diverse list here. Um, you know, I think it's more than twenty MCs. I think that we cover most, if not all, of the people that a lot of people will put in their top twenty. Um, but I also, we give respect to some of the underground heroes that don't necessarily get their shine, but have deep and passionate fan bases. Um, I think the one place we're underserving is women. We mm -hmm. always want to like point out our women. And we did a lot of research. I didn't find uh, top fives for Lauren Hill, for Missy, or for Rhapsody. The, the thing that I did find, which I think is a disservice to them, is uh, when people did ask the question, it was typically, who are your favorite uh, female MCs? Which, you know, that to me, like, you know, these are MCs, you know, so let's ask them who their favorite MCs are. But, you know, I think aside from that, we, we check a lot of boxes. Work, you know what, because works. you said that, and I'll bring it in later on, Little Kim has a list, but it's one of those which I was hesitant to, to mention because it's more like eight, it's not five. But we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll bring that in at some point because we absolutely need the balance. Yeah, let's talk about that for sure, for sure. Um, but just, just to give people that, that intel. Um, so what we're going to talk about is, we're going to name the list. We're going to talk about why they they themselves cited those people. We'll talk about what was surprising about the list, you know, kind of what we expected, the influences that we hear in their music. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, so we'll go from there. So we'll kick it off with Q since he's the one who sparked this whole debate. So he said Wayne uh, was his GOAT. Now, the interesting thing is, and this is what we talked about in terms of how these lists change over time is that back in 2019, uh, Ice Cube did an interview and he talked about his top five in that. And in this one, he said, it was Grandmaster Melly Mel, Ice-T, Chuck D, Keras one and Rakim. No mention of Wayne. And so that to me is really interesting um you know and later ones he, he includes wayne in like his top eight top ten and things like that but he was not in the top five there 
And what Cube said was, to me, those are the trendsetters, the ones who change the trajectory of the game in a major way. It was about skills and talent and really having their own style and taking it and running with it. And that to me is like what I would expect for, from Cube, like to, to go to the people who influenced him, who were his heroes growing up, you know, that to me is that top five. But I found it interesting because um, he had a lot of diversity and I think there was a lot more acceptance of different styles and locales and things like that back in the day. You know, um, it wasn't so like, I just like am down with one region and, and don't go beyond that. So it was cool to see him give love to Ice-T, who I'm sure like, you know, the original gangster, you know, was really, really influential for Q personally. Um, Chuck D, you know, obviously he went on to work with the Bomb Squad and you can hear that kind of philosophical, uh, political firepower in Cube's lyrics. Two booming voices. Yep, KRS-One, same thing, you know, um, and KRS-One actually, you know, I don't think people uh, cite him enough as one of the originators of gangster rap, you know, him and, and Schooly D, like, but, you know, Nine Millimeter Goes Bang and, you know, um, South Bronx, like he was banging on wax before a lot of people. And then Rakim, who a lot of people, especially from that era, I believe was the GOAT. That makes a lot of sense, especially with his multi-syllabic delivery. Um, I would say that Rakim was probably the one uh, who he sounds least like, Q, personally, you know, um, but it was interesting, that, but I, I can see why he would admire the, the straight lyricism. But what was anything uh, stick, stick out with you about that? Yeah, I mean, Cube's beginnings when he was working in CIA with Sir Jinx, and they only put out a handful of, of 12 inches, but, you know, like a lot of LA pioneers, um, you know, kind of draws from that electro funk, you know, stuff. And, and Ice T made that same transition when you look at, you know, Reckless and some of the early stuff that he put out with Chris the Glove Taylor. Um, so, yeah, it's cool to see that. Melly Mel and Ice T are two artists that come before Cube. You know, Melly Mel putting out albums, Ice T putting out a few singles. And then I look at Chuck. Chris and Rock Kim as contemporaries of Cube, especially, you know, when you look at NWA and the Posse, like Cube's making noise by 86, 87, you know? Um, so he's watching these other people, you know, lead to the diaspora of hip hop. And I think that's really cool. The other thing that I wanted to add is interesting, you know, Cube shouted out Wayne, that's why we're talking about it. Um, in 2009, I found a video where KRS-One said the same thing. And it's, hmm. And it, to Wayne himself, KRS is doing an interview, RIP to my man Bushwick Bill was behind him, some other folks, and Little Wayne happens to walk into the interview, and Chris says, this guy is the greatest rapper. Mm. Um, and it's so interesting, too, because at that time, you know, Wayne had upset a lot of people. He had criticized the DJ, and also, let's not forget, in that same iconic run of, of the mid-2000s, Wayne declared himself the best rapper alive, which you think would be upsetting to the long-standing goats which certainly cuban krs are part of but both of those guys you know have given dwayne carter his props absolutely absolutely and i think every mc has declared him or herself the best of all time at some point you know rap is a game of confidence confidence and uh you know i think that deservedly so by the way uh just in honor of the day I wore this, uh, you know, um, I got this at a dope store in Brooklyn, but yeah, that Mount Rushmore. Uh, so you want to take the next one? Yeah, man. You said every MC. And a few years ago, we, we ran a, during the pandemic, we covered on the site, a joint that the roots had never put out until they did the re re-release of, I think things fall apart. And it was black thought imitating his, his heroes. Um, so black thoughts list. And I, I say this right now, just, a few blocks from where Tariq grew up. Um, his list includes Rakim, which I do think you can hear with Black Thought, um, you know, at times when he chooses to be laid back. Cool G Rap, which to me, um, Black Thought is, is, you know, a huge derivative. I think we can remember that part. What is it? Um, is it Boom? Where Thought back on Tipping Point does Kane and then does G Rap. I think it's Boom, it's not Duck Down. Um, where he just raps as them. And for a lot of people, obviously in the Chappelle movie, G-Rap and Kane appear, but a lot of people, when they heard that for the first time, thought that that was actually them. Um, so that one makes sense. And then perfect setup. The next one is Big Daddy Kane. And the last two are KRS-One and Chuck D. And that is an incredible top five. To me, that's, 
that's uh i mean you look at it that's a school of 88 89 you know all of these guys were straight running things um each one of them you know new york dudes each of them different things but had that energy that finesse and that lyricism which you know black thought has been a huge upholder of um does that list anything stand out to you in there uh it's just interesting the overlap that he has with q you know, um, KRS, uh, Chuck D, Rakim, um, I, I see that. And it, to me, it's a reflection of the era. And Black Thought is just one of the illest, man. Like he, he is still today just a monster lyrically. Uh, so none of these surprise me. They're all like just straight ill lyricists. The one that is, I, I say, kind of deviates from that is Chuck D. I think Chuck, to your point, um, is more about substance and delivery more so than just lyricism. Um, and, but, you know, aside from that, like, you know, that, that makes all the sense in the world to me for black thought. Yeah. And I think in recent years, I mean, if you really, even you look at the funk flex freestyle, black thought has really done a phenomenal job of making references to black leaders, you know, Malcolm X and Ralph Ellison and, you know, all of these minds. And that's something you're going to get from Chuck D. I mean, Chuck D you know, influenced so many people to go beyond what was in the history books, to pick up different things, to be aware of social issues. And I do think Black Thought does that, but you're getting more of that, in my opinion, in the last 10 years than maybe at any other time in his career, not to say that it's not there. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, Thought is an MC that, you know, bursts on the scene in the mid 90s and really champions the greats and really leads to his DNA. You want to talk about another MC that I think does that in, in Snoop Dogg? Yeah, man, Snoop Dogg is, you know, like Black Thought, a dude who's still going strong um, almost 30 years later now. Well, literally 30 years later, because uh, Deep Cover was 92. And so we're 30 years into Snoop's career, which is insane. Uh, he's still making boss moves, just bought Death Row, is one of the pioneers, rap pioneers, again, in, a, in the metaverse. You know, he's done it in the real world. Now he's doing it in the metaverse. Is heavy into that. Just had, you know, maybe the highlight of his career with the Super Bowl performance with Dr. Dre is everywhere from Corona commercials to, you know, with Martha Stewart cooking. Like Snoop is just such a legend. So, you know, it's interesting to see what his top five is, you know, and he says it's Slick Rick, Ice Cube, LL Cool J, Karis One, Rakim, Run DMC, Big Daddy Kane, Ice T, and Too Short. And so, um, what he said was, um, actually, you know, and in and, and another interview, uh, he, he named a few more people. So For he released a tweet. Yeah, he released a tweet saying, a lot of ends been crying about me leaving people off my top 10 without even seeing my ish. So here it is. FYI, notice how none of my peers or MCs after me are on the list. Respect you. Jesus, what I was taught. If you offended, you'll get over it. I get left off a lot of top tens. I'm not even on this one. Um, so, uh, you know, again, it gets, it speaks to what we were talking about, how a lot of times it's people who are influential. And in this one, again, showing how this can differ from, from time to time, he says, Slick Rick, Ice Cube, LL, Karras, Rakim, he puts Run and DMC on there, Big Daddy Kane, Ice-T, and Too Short. So, uh, you know, but he's been pretty consistent, I think, in naming Slick Rick as number one for him. And that, to me, makes all the sense in the world, given just how similar their styles are. The storytelling, the cadence, the, you know, laid back kind of um, higher pitched flow. Snoop even paid homage to Slick Rick with um, Body Dottie. Dottie on Doggy Style. You know, to me, it just makes a lot of sense here. Uh, it's great to see him give uh, props to two West Coast OGs and Ice-T and Too Short. So, yeah, um, you know, Dog's List is, is really uh, is really cool. And it matches it. I mean, you know, that list doesn't come as a terrible surprise to me. Admittedly, my generation, I had probably heard Lottie Dottie, you know, on mix show at night. But, you know, I remember the first time I owned a copy of Lottie Dottie, it was the Snoop Dogg version. Um, and, and he did, you know, he did, he remade Freaky Tales for the, in the beginning, there was rap compilation a few years ago. He did, you know, I think for the movie old school or something, he remade paid in full, like Snoop is one of those artists, like a sixties artist 
that will pay homage by covering your song and putting money in your pocket. And I always think that's dope. Yeah. And so far, KRS and Rakim have made everybody's list we've covered. Yeah, yeah, which is great to see, too. And this is the first time we see Too Short, and I love the fact that Snoop does that because perhaps sort of like me putting Guru on my list, you know, Too Short is not somebody necessarily recognized for fast rapping or, you know, crazy compound bars. I know he's done it as his Guru, but it again shows you that this is subjective and you also can use it as an opportunity like to look at somebody who just like Ice-T um, you know, was putting on for the West Coast in a different region in the early 80s, which is pretty important. Yeah. So we've had MCs from the East Coast and thought we've had a couple West Coast dudes. Let, let's go down south for a minute. Um, let's talk about Scarface. Face Mob. Yeah. His list includes, um, you know, last time he went on record with it includes Nas, Run DMC, A Tribe Called Quest. So I like the fact that, you know, Brad Jordan, you know, sees the value in the group. And even though, I'm not mad when a top five includes um, a group, you know, because, you know, Fife put out one solo album before he died, you know, Run and DMC, they, at the height of their careers, they still kept it to the group. So he has both of those in there. And then he has two new artists, um, Kendrick Lamar and Nipsey Hussle. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, Face said this before Nip had passed, um, you know, which is again, just a powerful point in what he saw in the future. Yeah uh that is that that's deep to me for nipsey but you know when you think about a lot of faces substance you know he talks about that kind of like economic empowerment as well and you know, the buy black buy back the block mentality and so you know nipsey being such a proponent of that i can i can see why he would dig nipsey scarface it, also uh, strikes me as a student mm -hmm. of the game you know um he did a great interview uh, he did a great uh response our our, our family justin hunt did a video where he talked about, he named his top five and the importance of top fives in general. Definitely check out that video. You can check it out on his The Company Man YouTube. And I think it's on ours too. Um, and Face, you know, dialed in. He and, Fa he and Face are friends and said, listen, I respect your list. Amazing. Love those MCs. And I think Justin had put Face at number six. And he said, but I'm going to do this. I'm going to move myself from number six to number one. He said, because the man is mean. And he started like talking about his own like characteristics. And I always thought that was dope. Yeah, I like that too. And, and all of those artists, I mean, you know, even though it, it evolves over, over rap's trajectory, but they're storytellers. And to me, Scarface is one of the great storytellers, but you know, Run DMC could hold your attention through that. Tribe the same way. I left my wallet in El Segundo. I know it's not, you know, those dramatic stories that we got in the nineties from, you know, Biggie or, or Nas, but that's storytelling. There's a narrative form there. And certainly Kendrick and Nipsey did that too. So this list again, really makes a lot of sense to me. But I just mentioned, um, you know, one of the greatest trios of all time, Run DMC. Why don't you tell us about Rev Run's list? Yeah, Run has been on a couple lists so far. Uh, you would think that Run would go to like the, the uh, Grandmaster Kazes of the world and the Busy Bees and, you know, the guys who really were doing it before him, uh, maybe the Curtis Blow, since he was the son of Curtis Blow. Word. But when Ron was asked, he named some really surprising ones. This is probably the most surprising top five for me thus far. And he said, Drake, Nas, Rakim, Jay-Z, and Kanye West. Now, if this was from a dude in the 2000s, it wouldn't have been surprising. Uh, but to come from a guy who was such a pioneer as Run, that blew me away. And especially the Drake inclusion, given some of the controversy that Drake has endured over the years with, with ghostwriting and things like that. You know how I feel about that. I, you know, I think that Drake has one of the nastiest pins in hip hop. But a lot of people take exception to that um, with the Quentin Miller stuff that happened years ago. And if I might add, I do believe this, this conversation, I watched it again, preparing for this. It happened uh, with Sway in the morning, but it was from the mid 2000s. It may have taken place before the Meek Mill ghostwriter assault. And I'll add one other thing. Run, Rev Run in that conversation said, you know, and we've had a couple people with Taz. He said, can I get one more? And Sway, of course, said, sure. And it was Nicki Minaj. Um, so Nicki and Nas being the two Queens MCs, you know, that are very much, um, you know, benefited from running DMC and Jam Master J paving the way. 
Yeah, and great to see him name a woman. The first, the you know, first of the other ones we've covered to name a woman. You know, this was Nikki at her heyday, or you know, just right after that. Um, I think two or three, three or four years after the monster verse, which was her breakout verse. And so, yeah, great to see that. Uh, all right, so cool, man. We've been focused on a lot of the folks from the '80s and early '90s. Uh, let, let's let's bring it up. Let's bring it up to the 2000s. Uh, what about J. Cole? Yeah, in Aston, late 2014. Um, and I always think that matters in certain times, context. Cole said, uh, "Tupac, Biggie, Nas, and Jay Z." And um, you know, this one was a little bit of a surprise to me um, in some ways. I mean. You know, J. Cole burst on the scene with Let Nas Down early in his career. Um, you know, and obviously Jay-Z was the one that brought him to Rock Nation. The Tupac and Biggie thing, um, you know, they make sense for so many of us. I think when we see them on the list. But I don't know that with either one of those guys, I necessarily see their influence on Cole's music, just given the subject matter, given the intensity, given all of that. But you might hear something different. Yeah. Now, um, you know, I agree with all that. Um, I think that Cole is also a student. You know, he's a guy who has been um, very vocal about his love for his predecessors. In fact, you know, mm -hmm. did the song Let Nas Down, mm -hmm. uh, you know, really talking about the fact that he didn't believe that he lived up to the expectations that he had on himself and, and that his... Um, forefathers had for him with his first album and i think that song actually is one of the pivotal moments in his career to, to kind of turn it around when he got the remix with nas on it and like you know nas encouraging him uh which was phenomenal you know so uh on that subject let's let's go to nas because nas i think is on uh probably a huge amount of top five lists for people you know just given how influential he is and you know obviously we said he's on there for cole so Nas talked about, uh, recently he talked about his influences and um, his influences are, again, KRS-One, Rakim, Cool G Rap, Big Daddy Kane, Slick Rick, Dougie Fresh, he said, and then Heavy D. Uh, so Dougie Fresh and Heavy D are two of the really interesting ones for me there because, you know, Heavy was just so, he was so ill with it. Like, I, I just don't think he gets enough respect, man. Like that guy... Uh, with his uptown sound kind of ushered in like that fusion of like R&B and hip hop and yeah. some house music and could dance, perform. He had the total package and he was ill with it lyrically too, you know? So, you know, uh, rest in peace and, and salute to Heavy D. And Dougie Fresh, just a tremendous entertainer. You know, uh, a lot of people mentioned Slick Rick, but Dougie was nice on the mic too. And with the beatboxing and performing too. It's interesting that Nas picked those guys who like, you know, got the party party started because um, and you hear that in some of his music like um, Made You Look and, you know, uh, some of the some of the, the more up tempo Nas joints. Yeah, I, I was surprised by that, too. And, and I think Dougie is worth to point out, you know, you know, Dougie has classic singles, two of them with Slick Rick. But I don't think Dougie Fresh is somebody who ever benefited from having a must own album. Um, so again, Nas's list, I'm sure, is influenced by performance and just by things beyond just the album pedigree, which matters. And I like to see that. And I wholeheartedly agree. Right before we jumped on this call, I was listening to a conversation with Pete Rock back in the day, and he was just saying that Heavy, you know, decided you didn't need to bring a guest singer onto a song. You could do it yourself and you could do it with melody and with style. And you're absolutely right. I know he has a totally different sound than Drake. But as we give credit to the Nate Dogs and the TJ Swans, um, you know, the people that brought Melody into hip hop, Heavy D needs to be their front and center because he could rap and he could also make a catchy song that would fit into an R&B playlist. Yeah. And then Nas was also asked about uh, of this generation. Mm -hmm. And in that he named Kendrick, Drake, again, you know, uh, Rick Ross, who I think is, is, you know, left off a lot of conversations. Um, I once had to advocate for him pretty hard at, for something at BET I won't get into, but I had to really push. Um, Lil Wayne, again, rears his head, and then obviously he returned a favor to J. Cole, too. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because Wayne has is, is relevant through multiple generations, but I think we often forget 
you know, Wayne was making albums in the mid nineties. Um, you know, Wayne has had a really incredible run that you compare him to Nas and Jay-Z. I mean, they had a few years on him, but Wayne's been doing it. It's just so interesting that Wayne's first 10 or so years, he doesn't get a lot of credit. I think for a lot of us, I'll say myself included, saw the hot boys were like, eh, you know, these guys had dope beats and a presence to them and the videos and all of that. But it wasn't until the Carter two that I started to realize, wow, Wayne is, is really a contender in this. So to see Nas lump him in with these guys that were introduced in the 2010s, um, you know, 15, damn near 20 years after Wayne, is just an interesting um, lesson in perspective and, and relevance. Yeah, you know, I obviously heard Wayne in his Hot Boys days and, and stuff with Cash Money in the, um, the late 90s. I didn't get into the mixtape era, Wayne, you know, which I think is probably why I've not been as big a fan because I, I, I think that that's when he really positioned himself as one of the elite lyricists. Mm -hmm. And so when uh, MTV declared him as the, the hottest rapper alive, it was a bit of a head scratcher for me at the time. Um, you know, it was, if I recall correctly, still a time where um, Jay-Z had not really come back fully. And me being as big a Jay-Z fan as I was, like the answer to me is always going to be Jay-Z. Like Michael Jordan should have been the MVP every year. Uh, yeah. But this was like, if I can make a basketball analogy, this was like Wayne slid in and became the ha Hakeem Olajuwon of rap. You know, so when Jordan was out, Hakeem showed his dominance, became that guy. And Jordan came back and like, you know, um, and so Wayne got that, that window, um, 2006, 2008, whatever it was. And I think that's when that that's when I really started paying attention. And for me, it was Carter three. That's interesting. And I, I go back to what Cube said, too. And I think that we are dealing with a lot of little Wayne clones in that shadow, even if Wayne's run for you and I is limited to, um, you know, not his run. His, his, his run is, is clearly everlasting, but his his peak performance is limited to three or four years. Um, you look at, you know, I know you credited Kendrick to Andre 3000, but I think Wayne is a huge influence on Kendrick's. And then I look at a JID, um, I see it there and, you know, a future and, and Wayne took the steering wheel of rap music and, 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 and changed so many people after him. So I, I feel you, I feel you, but I, I think that, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you on the, on the Kendrick piece too. And Kendrick has like explicitly talked about that in the past when, um, I think when Wayne was talking about retiring, uh, Kendrick did a video, you're basically almost begging him not to retire. And, um, you know, when you listen to dedication, like some of Kendrick's early mixtapes, it sounds literally just like Wayne and, mm -hmm. you know, times Jay-Z. So there's no question that the impact that Wayne had on Kendrick. Um, I want to talk about time. it. Oh, you, yeah. I'm going to take list. this one. I'm okay. going to take this one. It's because, yours. Uh, Cause yeah, it's yours. Like, uh, um, Nice segue there. Uh, the dude who built Def Jam uh, after that Tila Rock single um, was LL Cool J. And uh, again, that was my second favorite MC. Um, and I got a big gigantic uh, uh, photo of him on my wall. Um, got to sit down with him uh, a few years ago and that was just absolutely incredible. He is more charismatic and uh, bigger than life in life. Uh, just like, just a great dude and has shown himself to be a fan. I don't know if people know, but you know, the Rock the Bells channel on Sirius XM, LL picks every single song played on that radio uh, station, which I think is just, is crazy um, because, you know, to be that invested in the music and the brand and to want to keep up like that is, is just really dope. Um, his list is interesting to me too, because it's a blend of, um, actually it's, it's, it's peers and, and people who like came after him. So um, it's Big Daddy Kane, Cool G Rap, Eminem, Pharaoh Monch, Chuck D and Ice Cube for the tie, which, you know, just, just, that's just a really interesting list. You know, it's a combination of people who are just superior lyricists and, uh, people who have like real strong substance. All the dudes have substance too, but uh, you know, political substance, I should say, in the Chuck D and the Ice Cube. So it's cool. a real interesting list, but anything strike you about that? 
Well, so this list comes from, I watched it this morning. It's a live, an IG live conversation between LL Cool J and Busy B. So Busy B is one of those pioneering MCs. And even, even he says it, I think LL says it, and I love the way he said it. He goes, you're a, you're, you're a, you're a founder, you're a hip hop founder, Busy B, and I'm a pioneer. Like, like even ahead of the pioneers as our founding fathers and mothers, and Busy B is one of them. So for context sake, if you're talking to an architect of this thing that you love, you would think that that list might even skew. If there's going to be bias, it's going to go that away. And instead, he uses this opportunity to, you know, include Eminem and Pharaoh Monch among um, some 1980s descendants, you know, because LL's out there first. Then you get your Kane, your G-Rap, and your Chuck D and your Ice Cube. But I love the fact that he goes to bat for Pharaoh Monch. Um, because that's somebody else, not unlike a black thought that has been doing this for 30 years. Um, and if you know Pharaoh's story, you know, he's overcoming asthma, incredible concept wizard. Um, it's just a really dope thing to kind of see a full circle generational conversation about hip hop like that. Yeah, I agree. And that's not a name you hear in a lot of top fives, but a name I think like black thought who could be on anyone's top fives and nobody can look at you sideways because he's just so incredibly ill, so diverse, um, takes risks, has been relevant for 25 years or so now. I think he deserves to be on anybody's top five list without anybody flinching or blinking. You know, We had a great conversation with him last year, man. And of all the times in my life, my Wi-Fi, I was in the middle of that storm in Texas that eventually, uh, you know, uh, Ted Cruz ran to Cancun to get away from. <laughs> and I couldn't get my internet to work right. So I'm, I'm part of it for like a minute and then you and Pharaoh brought it home. But yeah, um, it's all good, man. So, well, speak- so bringing it home, why don't, you, why don't you talk about Pharaoh? Yeah, I mean, he, oddly enough, you know, so many of these times artist lists can change because they're put on the spot in an interview. But Pharaoh actually tweeted his out. Um, and his list is dope, too. He puts on Eminem, Kendrick Lamar, Nas, three names that we've heard throughout this conversation. And he adds two new ones, one being Busta Rhymes and the other being Royce the Five Nine. And I really like that because, you know, Busta, again, I mean, you're looking at somebody that's 30 plus years in this, has been phenomenal at evolving, um, can certainly rap slow, but has been a purveyor of that fast rap, just like, you know, Black Thought, just like Tongue Twister, just like a number of people. Busta's incredible. And the live show, you know, when we look back at Nas putting Dougie Fresh on there, Busta Rhymes, I would argue, is better live than he is on record. And I think he's made some incredible records, including in the last two years. We have a whole episode dedicated to his ELE2 album. Um, Also love seeing Royce on here. You know, Royce is somebody that, again, like Pharaoh, like Black Thought, um, like Pasta News, is not a name you see a lot of on here um, in general. And I think he absolutely deserves to be here. And I believe Pharaoh tweeted this before some of the albums that Royce has put out recently. I think that Royce is somebody who's made his best work, his current work, especially in the last three. So I really, really love to see that. And you get in some Midwest representation as we're talking about, you know, props to the South, props to the West. You got, you know, of course, Eminem is a recurring voice, but to also see Royce on the same list, that says something. Yeah, no, I think it's really interesting for him to put two Detroit MCs. And uh, for a lot of people, like Royce lives in the shadows of them. Uh, but Royce, we've talked about for uh, you know a number of years, has established himself to be one of the best MCs uh, of his generation and has really stepped into his own in his 40s. And I think the last five years or so have been uh, the best work of his career. So, again, another person who doesn't get mentioned, but very, very deserved of inclusion. Some another artist that I think, you know, we will see uh, shortly, but that is from the Midwest. That is very, very respected is Lupe Fiasco. He didn't give five, but he gave a definitive three. You want to break it down? Yeah, I'm going to let you break this one down, but I'm going to say it's interesting that we go from Royce to Lupe because, you know, again, shameless plug, but like these two had a dust up last summer that was wildly entertaining and set the underground Internet on fire, um, you know, where they just kind of had a war of words that was fueled in part about who's the best rapper. Um, Mm -hmm. at the time, you know, and um, there was a lot of chatter about like RJ Payne 
and um, Mickey Fax and Ransom being dudes who could stand with Royce um, when it came to lyricism and bars and Royce begged to differ. And it led to, uh, you know, Instagram wars, some, some diss records and things like that. But Lupe and Royce, I think, had the most heated exchange. So, yeah, uh, you want to talk about Lupe? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And Lupe just put out a new album, by the way, uh, Drill Music and Zion. We got a couple of, I think, both of ours agreed favorite joints on the playlist right now. So another shameless plug for that. Uh, Lou's top three, um, Jay-Z, Eminem, and Nas. That's a recurring list that you're seeing throughout. But, you know, Jay-Z, people don't always remember, Jay-Z executive produced Food and Liquor, even though it wasn't on Rock, uh, Rock Nation, Rockefeller at the time. Um, Jay very much went to bat for Lupe. And I'm, that one didn't surprise me. Um, you know, Nas, Lupe, and, and this is kind of why I avoided the top five question. I, I think it was with me. It may have been with somebody else back in the day in the mid 2000s. But Lupe was one of those people that always went to bat for it was written. He was like, that's my Nas album, even though people might think based on subject matter, that he would be more of an Illmatic guy, you know, but but he liked the mafioso raps on the second album. Eminem came as a surprise because I don't, I'm trying to think, Lupe and M, do you remember them working together? They might have on that Lasers album. I don't know. In that yeah, era. I, don't know. I don't know, but it, uh, no surprises, no, no, no huge surprises here, but yeah, some Midwest love for, for Marshall. But as we talk about Lou, perfect segue, I'll pass it back to you for an artist that, uh, you know, you've been close to over the years, Absol. Yeah, you know, it's interesting now because we're getting into MCs who have been later and we've seen a lot of Eminem, a lot of Nas, you know, so for artists who were of the 80s, or early 90s, you get the Rockhams, the Chuck D's, um, the Big Daddy Canes. For artists who are of the early O's and late 90s, you're starting to see that Eminem, Nas, um, you know, and so the next artist is Absol who is, I think, a favorite MC of a lot of favorite MCs, you know, especially of that, you know, 2010s generation. A guy who is just lyrically just out of there. It takes, you know, repeat listens to dissect all the, the metaphors and double entendres that he drops. Um, still to this day, one of my favorite um, songs he did is with Mac Miller producing. Uh, oh man, that, that joint is just so tough. Uh, but. So Absol of TDE, you know, Black Hippie with Kendrick and J-Rock and Schoolboy Q, he mentions Lil Wayne, Jay-Z, Nas, Eminem, and then Lupe Fiasco, you know, so um, nice segue there for Lou. Uh, the other ones, no surprise, like him being the kind of lyricist that he is, um, you know, it, it makes sense that each of these guys is someone that influenced him. Uh, and Lupe, especially because Ab is very conceptual and like has really far out like thoughts he thinks, you know, is very philosophical in his lyricism. And I think Lupe is like that, too. You know, wasn't Lupe he, is very much an artist with, with like, you know, true concepts he wants to flesh out. Wasn't it Ab, uh, one of my favorite songs on his at Illuminate, where he said, I think I can rap better than Jay-Z. That was him, right? Like yeah, he went yeah, out, yeah, he went yeah, on one yeah, of his yeah. influences. And I love that song. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting one. The Wayne one on that list kind of kind of surprised me, to be honest. But I think that Ab grew up in that era where Wayne, what we keep talking about, was just running things. Well, when you think about like punchy, um, you know, punchy, like um, 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 what's the punchlines? Uh, yeah. Punchy punchlines. Uh, <laughs> Wayne is that guy. You know, Wayne is like one of the wittiest MCs and Ab is like that, too. You know, yeah. Um, he said that on that Mac Miller song, he says, as getting bigger and I ain't doing sit ups like uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so, uh, he just he's always got like funny lines like that. So I can see I can see the Wayne influence in there, too. That's a really good point. So we haven't talked about any Wu-Tang Clan MCs. Um, so I think it's really important to run down Raekwon's list. We haven't heard Ray's name yet. Come up in others. Now, important piece of context. Ray was asked non Wu affiliated. So he's looking past you know, his fellow uh, eight swordsmen and his list includes Rock Kim, Slick Rick, G-Rap, uh, Blastmaster KRS and Chuck D. And, you know, this is interesting, too, because sort of like a Snoop, you can hear these influences in Wu-Tang. I mean, the samples, there's little homages in their bars. 
but it's almost like Ray, especially, but a lot of the clan just ran it through a filter where you can get that derivative stuff, but it's not going to be as on the nose as it is with Snoop, you know, doing the cover records and stuff. But that list didn't exactly surprise me. Any, any, any jump out for you? No, man. Uh, given the era and, uh, you know, of, of Wu, again, like starting off in the early 90s, this list corresponds to everyone else who was in there. Those, those are the guys, you know, um, there's probably 10 guys that, that are interchangeable and, yeah. you know, and Rakim is always going to show up there. Um, you know, KRS is going to show up there, Chuck D and then, then it's interchangeable. So it, yeah, it's not surprising for me. I, I think the G rap influence makes a lot of sense just given the subject matter that that a lot of Wu had, you know, that grimy uh, street life kind of subject matter. None of those guys care us, you know, yes, uh, too. But but Cool G Rap took it to a different level. And, you know, so I, I, that part, I think, is um, most interesting to me. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, KRS starts out early in his career, you know, with the guns on the cover and criminal minded. And then he kind of evolves into the teacher and G Rap kind of started out, you know, I mean, he, there, there's certain gangster references in his music, but then he really leaned into that mafioso stuff. And, and, and um, G Rap on those Wu chamber music compilations, like, you know, he fits nicely into the, the Wu family. So that one, I agree with you 100%. You know, so with that said, an artist um, that I think also kind of fits into this conversation we're having, um, actually, I'll take this one is, is Action Bronson. So when these lists were, 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 popping up on the scene, um, Vinny Paz from Jedi Mind Tricks actually went out and he texted a number of people. And this was 2011. So he texts Action Bronson, they had made some stuff together and he got his, his list. And Bronson, again, Bronson's a Queens guy. G-Rap, Bronson said, all of Wu-Tang, Pimp C from UGK, four is a tie of Nas and AZ. And then number five is interesting because it's Core Mega. So you got Nas, AZ and Core Mega, that's uh, three fifths of the firm, not including Foxy and Nature. Really interesting stuff. Love that. Pimp C, I did not see coming. Um, you know, Pimp C, and, and it's not the last time we're going to see his name today, but not necessarily renowned as a spiritual lyrical miracle spitter. But Pimp C is quite the showman and quite the originator, um, just in his images and his attitude and being a heavy presence on the mic. Um, G rap is of no surprise to me with Bronson. And then Wu Tang's interesting because, you know, Bronson made that influence known at the onset of his, his kind of blow up. And then for folks that pay attention, and you can read it about it on Ambrosia for Heads, there were some dust ups in the years that followed between Papa Wu and Ghostface Kill and Action Bronson. But early on, you know, Bronson was clear about his influences. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people really thought that he was almost biting Ghostface Killer's um, flow, um, Action Bronson. It was so uh, similar. It is a lot of ways uh, like how Drew was, your old Drew was with Nas, you know? Word. And again, I don't see that as biting. I see that as these guys being deeply influenced by the MCs. And like with Kendrick and so many other people, it takes a while for them to find their own voice. And, you know, so they, they start off rapping because they probably were rapping to the records of all their favorites. And that, that's what they sounded like when they first started. So, yeah, you wouldn't say it about Snoop and Slick Rick and you wouldn't say it about Black Thought and G-Rap. Uh, yeah, it's just it's a different time. But, you know, as I mentioned, Vinny in his list, I think we should include his. You want to take that one? Well, yeah. So, yeah. Um, the, so the Wu makes total sense for me. I, I'll just say on, on, on um, Pimp C for me for Action Bronson. I think that makes a lot of sense too, because again, Pimp C was a really funny dude uh, on the mic and he would just say wild shit. And Action Bronson is very much like that. Like, you know, he'll just out of nowhere say, just just paint an image that's just like crazy. So it's a great point. To me, the, the Pimp C part like makes a lot of sense for him too. I also think it's really interesting that he had Nas and AZ. Uh, you know, I don't think a lot of people give, you know, despite the fact that most people or a lot of people think AZ outshone Nas on that last bitch um, guest verse, I don't think that AZ gets the props that he deserves. We did a great interview with him um, last year. You guys can find that on the channel too. Uh, so I think it's cool that he's mentioning, you know, all these guys instead of just like, you know, choosing one. But yeah, so Vinny Paz, um, super interesting one. Uh, why don't you talk about that and talk about why we included him on You talked, you said yeah, it Yeah, I mean, Vin, so, you know, as we talk about this, Vin the Chin has been one of my favorite people to discuss hip hop with just, I mean, 
having for me lived in Philly a lot of my life, Vin is a Philly hip hop historian. You know, if you ever want to talk about, you know, Schooly D, Cool C, Steady B, he was he was the guy and, and also, you know, was very much on the scene since the 90s. So he did the list and, and let's not, you know, Vin has a really original style to me, um, just that true definition of hardcore, the way he kind of bellows into the mic. So he put his own out there. And after running down a list of, you know, from from 20 people, he did his own back in, again, this is 2011, but his was G-Rap, who he worked with, Big Pun, first time we've seen Pun, I believe, Jay-Z, Rakim, and number five is interesting, Tragedy Gaddafi, aka The Intelligent Hoodlum. Um, which is not somebody I necessarily expected. And that's no shots at tragedy, but you know, you don't hear that name come up in these lists a lot. So um, any, any strong takeaways for you there? No, it's just very interesting. You know, Vinny has such a strong cult following and audience and he's got such a clearly defined lane. You know, he is um, never chased commercial success or anything like that. He's really a, a, a purist in a lot of ways in terms of like what he's looking to do. And so I think that that is a through line for this, uh, with the exception of, of of Jay mostly, because I think Pun was kind of at that intersection where he didn't, you know, change his style or anything. It's just like people came to him, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Jay has has chased commercial success. At, you know, I, I think he did admit that himself, especially with uh, the second album, um, and has changed his style and things like that. So I think that one is really interesting. Um, that's that's the most interesting to me is the Jay Z inclusion. That's that's the one that sticks out of these for me. So yeah. So another MC uh, that's important is is corrupt. You want to talk about him? Speaking of great conversation with him last year, corrupt is always entertaining. Yeah, corrupt is one of my favorite MCs, man. I, 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 again, I love the West Coast. Um, I love that whole Death Row era. I love, um, you know, the Dog Pound, uh, you know, their first album is just like still like one of my favorites of all time, just musically, lyrically, all that. And Corrupt is just such a just ill spitter, you know. Um, he's a guy who, despite being from Philly, I think people associate him with L.A. Uh, and so he's got that combination of great G-Funk uh, music, but but I think the kind of lyric, lyricism and, and uh, flow of like an, M, an uh, East Coast MC. So he brings a lot to the table and you can see that in his influences and they are Rakim, KRS-One, Cool G Rap, Biggie and the DLC. Uh, it's the first time we, we hear the DLC's name in here. Makes total sense for Corrupt given the importance of the DLC and that death row legacy having written so many of Dr. Dre's rhymes and being such a big part of the chronic. Yeah. Um, you can totally hear the Rakim, the Cool G rap, the Biggie in Corrupt style. It's fascinating that he includes Biggie given you know the, the history between Death Row and Bad Boy at the time and, and, and all that that represented. Um, and again, KRS One, man, KRS One and Cool G rap, I gotta say are two of the, the names who've come, who've come out in this list the most. So yeah, um, real interesting list from Corrupt. You got you got thoughts on that? No, I I, I like that one a lot. Um, yeah, and and I'll, I'll do one of the MCs he shouted, you know, which is the DOC, which is one of the the freshest um, mentions. I don't think it's the first time DOC said it, but last month in June he appeared on Sway in the Morning, and Sway but, asked a real. Oh, sorry to sorry to interrupt i just wanted to, I, I was just looking at this and you dropped this in um one of the things corrupt actually had some really interesting things to say about um his list okay and so he said you know what is an mc a microphone controller you understand me a master of ceremony it is different than a guy who sells millions and millions of records that doesn't make them an mc that makes them a great artist you got to understand that an MC isn't the same thing as being a rapper or being an artist. It's a whole different ball game. That's why you see a lot of East Coasters mentioned in my top five MCs because they created this whole art form we call MCing. Being an MC is kind of a privilege. We don't call them rappers. You call them MCs because they're the master of ceremony. They rock the party. Their rhymes are ridiculous. When I'm picking my top five dead or alive, it's a hard list to get on, but you just got to be a certain caliber of rapper. Mm. So... Sorry about that, but certain caliber rapper, I think the DLC clearly uh, was on his way to being that. And yeah. please continue. No, no, no. That's a that's a great 
I'm glad you added that. Yeah, the DOC, which I think justifies why he would make Corrupt's list with literally one and a half albums ahead of his accident. Um, you know, and, and, and songwriting contributions. You know, Sway asked the DOC about his formula for songwriting and asked him kind of in the same breath, like who he really sees of the new class. It was interesting that he said Ken, uh, Kendrick Lamar um, because, you know, you've got a 25-year gap Really, a, I guess, a yeah, 22 year gap between no one, no one can do it better and Section 80. Um, and, and to me, you know, yes, they're both kind of in the same tutelage of Dr. Dre, although in very different ways. DOC got a whole album produced by Dre and Yella. Kendrick has had a handful of songs, but he really kind of went to the mat for Kendrick's ability to do all of those things, you know, flow, story, cadence, et cetera. Um, and it was great, again, and we've talked about this, to watch an OG who was just on Corrupt's list go to bat for an artist that's came that far after him. And I'm sure they've run into each other, you know, in, in Dre's studio in different places. But again, it's not like the DOC is, is vested in Kendrick Lamar's life and career. Yeah, you know, the, the thing that was interesting for me about that interview is not only did the DOC give Kendrick props, he said that if he had continued rapping, he would be Kendrick Lamar. Like that's what his style would have evolved to, you know? And he talked about, he said, you're talking about the formula. The reason I got to be so good at this thing is because of Rev Run, Rakim, Karras, One, and Slick Rick. I studied those dudes to the point to where, to whatever they could do, I could do. Then I added a little me into it. And then that's the formula. Every guy that claims to be a king, that's the same formula they've used, whether they'll admit it or not. They studied this guy, this guy who taught who they thought was dope. They started doing things that sounded like that guy. And over a period of time, it morphed into themselves. And that's how they were made. So you can't be the king if you added D if, if you added DLC in your sauce. That means we the king. And that's exactly what we've been talking about, man. Right. Like the reason why these guys sound like um, their peer, their, the, the guys who influenced them before is because that's who they were trying to like be better than, you know? Yeah. And so um, it's really interesting to hear one of the dudes who's the best to ever do it and who was the voice for so many acknowledge that. And then it's about Kendrick, he said, I got to say this about Kendrick, because if I'd lived in, the, in that rap space and continue to grow, I would have liked to grow into that. To be, uh, so that's that's crazy. That, that, that's just incredible praise from one of the dudes who was the pioneer of West Coast rap to say that's who we'd want to become. Uh, so yeah, that leads into Kendrick, um, you know, one of my goats, uh, love him to death. Um, you know, Kendrick said, Jay-Z, Eminem, Pac, Biggie, and Snoop. So what's interesting about that for me is that, you know, Kendrick, obviously been around since like 2006 or so, 2007, maybe 2008, came into prominence 2011 with Section 80. So here's a dude who's really like stepping into his own in the 2010s, but he's going back 10 years. Like he's showing himself that he is uh, in, in 15 years with a snoop, like, um, you know, 18 years. Um, uh, and he's showing that he is a student of the game. And so, you know, the J makes total sense because I think, you know, a lot of people regard J as a Michael Jordan of rap, Pac, Biggie, M, um, but Snoop, you know, I think is his West Coast influence because uh, if he was an East Coast dude, he probably would have thrown in like a woo dude or, or someone like that. But to put Snoop in there, I think, you know, shows his West Coast roots too. And Snoop had made that point too of he often doesn't appear on lists. And I like the fact that Kendrick did that because Snoop isn't necessarily a quote unquote cool answer, you know. Um, and, and when Justin also did a video on, on Snoop's argument as the greatest of all time. And I think there's a lot of merit there. And I think that much like LL Cool J, sometimes Snoop suffers, um, when, especially when you look at what he's done. And I love that. You know, I was listening to Anti Diaries this week, and it was lost on me when the album dropped that in that song, you know, Kendrick mentions listening, listening to a lot of quick albums or uh, the new quick album. Like it's a passing reference but I love the fact that he treats the voices on the West Coast of equal value to the quote unquote cool table. So yeah, I mean, that list is a reflection of that. Um, next up is Jadakiss and, and Jadakiss, you can't do this list without Jada. He's not the person that I think coined the phrase top five dead or alive, 
but in one of the smartest campaigns, um, you know, about damn near 10 years ago now, Jada went with that. I mean, he had been leaning into it for a while um, as at a time when I think the attention had moved to the South and had moved, you know, to the Kendricks. Um, and he really went to bat for himself as a greater, a great artist. And what's interesting is, is that album, um, Top Five Dead or Alive, I look at, it didn't measure up to the title. And that's certainly not the first hip hop album to do it. Um, you know, you and I ran a, a, a piece last year that I think is, remains accurate. The highlight of Jada's career was the verses. Mm. Um, that was a moment that we saw why he deserves to be in the consideration of Top Five Dead or Alive. But Jada throughout his career has had these incredible verses. We haven't heard his name yet today, but in doing so, he revealed his own top five list. Um, but none of these, I don't think, include the artists themselves as just a passing point. But for Jada, his is Biggie, Jay-Z, Nas, Styles P, and DMX. And obviously, you know, Jada, the locks had been around for a minute, but very much got onto the scene in the closing days of Biggie's life where Bad Boy was at the time, and then Styles P being his bandmate, both in The Locks and D-Block, and then X was Big Bro. I mean, you know, in a lot of ways, I think X really pushed the door open for The Locks, especially on that first album. Um, this is the first time we're seeing DMX's name, and I do believe this list um, came from before X passed away. So just a lot to unpack there. Yeah, that one's really interesting to me for a few reasons. You know, so first of all, it, it is Crew Love, like you mentioned. You know, he's definitely had affiliations with, with Biggie and obviously uh, Styles and, you know, and with DMX too. And he's collaborated with, with um, you know, Jay and Nas. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that he's naming peers. On the one hand, you might think, okay, if you were to say, don't include your crew, who would it be? Maybe it would have been a different list, but... The thing that strikes me about this not being just like pure crew love is that he did not include Sheik Luch. Yeah. You know, um, obviously his member, um, they've stayed together for 25 plus years now. Um, you know, recently did a project, we interviewed them um, and we got lots of plugs today. Uh, we got a great interview a um, uh, couple years ago on the channel. So there's love there, right? And so for him not to include Sheik is not is is interesting. You know, I don't think it's disrespect. I think it's just honesty as to who he really loves. And so yeah, I find I found that one to be really interesting. You know, I went back. I, I was trying to find the first time Jada Kiss made the association for himself as top five that are lab. I believe it is the Made You Look remix from Nas, which came out in 20, 2002. Um, so that's interesting to me. I mean, the locks first appearance on wax is in 94 on the main source album. Um, and I don't think Jade is on, I think it's just styles and chic, but you know, here you've got a guy less than 10 years into his recording career and he's already touting himself. And I love that confidence. You know, we talked about Wayne, you know, crowning himself the best rapper alive and just like Royce, just like a lot of others, Jada kisses, um, best moments in my opinion have been later in his career than earlier but he's got a lot of highlights either way. Yeah, agree, agree. So, so next up is um, Ari the Rugged Man. Yeah. And I think like Vinny Paz, um, he is an artist who's been extremely uncompromising in his craft. Also, you know, like Lupe and others, he's very, very conceptual. You know, he, his music ranges from like super raunchy to being like a, a, a hip hop father and like taking care of his, I believe his daughter, um, you know, just, he has just such a wide range, uh, really interesting figure. And his list is one of the more interesting ones too. Um, he has Master Ace and Tragedy as a tie for number one. Number two is Cool Mo D. Number three is Chuck D. Number four is Red Man. And number five is Slick Rick and Dougie Fresh. So again, you know, he's including Slick and Dougie on this, not just, just carving out Slick. Um, the Master Asian tragedy is just, that's, that's a really strong one. And I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. Cool Mo D. Now that's the first we've heard for, of him in this list. Cool Mo D was one of the architects, you know, uh, Treacherous Three and, um, you know, in, in Beat Street, like just so influential. Uh, even before LL and Run, this is the guy who was like um, blazing a, a trail. 
uh red man too uh first time we've heard red's name first time we've heard red man's name and red man you know is top five for a lot of folks so really interesting list so of um master ace and tragedy uh ari had this to say he said ace might be the most consistent mc of all time he has been a top tier mc since the late 80s and still is a top tier mc today and Tragedy isn't as consistent as Ace album-wise, but is most likely the more influential and lyrical MCs of the two. Without Tragedy, Nas or Mob Deep would not exist. He was one of the heaviest influences on the entire Queensbridge sound, and not to mention one of the most lyrical MCs on the planet since he was 14 years old. That's extremely high praise. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, I love that, I love that, that, that point. You know, I mean, one of the first people to represent the bridge on that level. I know we associate it with, you know, Shan and, and Marley, but, you know, tragedy started out young. One of the first kind of rap prodigies, um, you know, is also uh, the kind of the third element of the war report with Capone and Noriega, which many people consider, you know, a classic, if not close to album. It's really great to see that. And we, we saw that, you know, this is the second mention of tragedy. And I do think that tragedy has two sides. On one hand, you've got the intelligent hoodlum, you know, who very much kept, um, you know, those pro-black messages alive, kind of towed the line similar to a KRS of, of gangster rap, but a lot of like put a book in your hand and a gun in the other one. But also, I mean, tragedy is so influential to the RAs, to the Vinnie Pazes, to the, you know, um, just a whole subset of quote unquote hardcore hip hop. So to see him get the love is huge. And I totally agree on Master Ace. You know, we have another shameless plug, an interview with Master Ace and Marco Polo. And I believe that Ace makes better music in the, you know, 20 teens with his last album than he did at the onset of his career with Marley Production. I mean, Ace continues to make incredible bodies of work despite being one of the lowest key members of the Juice Crew. And if we go simply off of art, storytelling, concepts, Ace is every bit in step with Kane, G-Rap, Bismarcky, Roxanne, Shante, Craig G, you know, that. So I love this list. I, I really, I'm glad we included it. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, a Brooklyn story, that album was so incredible. Uh, another dude is in the concepts. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really, really amazing list. And you meant, I mean, Redman, it's not the last time we're going to see the name today, but we haven't seen Method Man's name. Um, and, and I know those guys work together, but I look at their styles just as solo artists and they have a similar approach. It's why they jive so well together. But, um, you know, what do you, what do you think is truly unique about, you know, Red? As a sidebar, we have not seen Eric Sermon or Parrish Smith so thus far either. Yeah. You know, for me, you know, the moment the red man jumped out of the speaker for me was um, Headbanger by EPMD. That to me was like a Buster Rhymes level uh, breakout performance on a, on a posse record. Like, you know, and, and I actually when you think about it, it was very similar. The animation, the rah, rah, you know, um, like he, I think he revs it like a dungeon. I think he like, um, um, he referenced that uh, on it and he just was such a star. And he's another guy who's been just incredibly consistent over the last 25 years or so. He injects a lot of humor. Um, he has like double entendres that, you know, switching up speeds like Bruce Lee riding a Fuji in a movie. Like, I mean, he yeah. just, he's just so ill with it. And um, he's a dude who's also very proudly been uncompromising too. He's never, changed his formula you know he's wrapped over trap beats and things like that just to show up but he's still red man and doing so so he's a pioneer for a lot of people absolutely um <clears throat> let me one of my favorite artists uh drake yeah i'll say that <laughs> i'll take this to get along me too you you get it you can have aubrey <laughs> go for it i know i know him and logic like battle for your heart so uh <laughs> Uh, one of my favorite artists truly is, is Drake. Um, we had a controversial take uh, a couple of years ago where we talked about how Drake is bigger than Michael Jackson. And if you go back and look at the stats, uh, commercial sales wise and airplay wise, uh, they speak for themselves, but not to start another fire uh, when I don't need to. Um, Drake had Biggie, Jay, Wayne, Jeezy, Andre 3000 and Young Tony, an artist who I've never heard of before um, from OVO. Yeah. This was in a tweet that, Jay, that uh, Drake did 
I'm assuming that young Tony uh, had probably dropped a project around then. And so this is Drake's way of getting a little heat for him. But, you know, the Biggie J um, um, reference was interesting because li like Kendrick, he's paying homage to artists who were, you know, 10, 15 years his predecessor. Jay also appear and and many times like a friend of me because he and Jay have traded sneak disses quite a few times on record is an interesting inclusion um you know and then Jeezy that one's out of nowhere for me um you know the so such a contrast to Drake's style but Jeezy also was uh, at the top of the heap with uh Wayne around you know in the mid 2000s or so mid to late 2000s and so that makes a lot of sense as Drake was starting to enter into the game that, uh, you know, the guy who was at the top of the food chain would be on his list. I thought Andre 3000 was really interesting uh, that Drake included him, but Kendrick did not. Because for me, I hear more of Andre's influence on Kendrick's music than I do on Drake. Um, so that was really interesting. And Wayne, you know, obvious that that's crew love. That's the guy who in large part put him on. But what about the list strikes you? Yeah, the Jeezy one's a surprise to me um, because I think Jeezy has one of my, you know, not, I won't even say favorite. Jeezy has a great voice in rap and a great ear for production. I've never really found him to be that compelling as a rapper. Um, I, That's just me. The, of all the names we've run down, um, and, and don't get me wrong, I own Jeezy albums. I paid cash money for them. But when we're talking about greatest rappers, that's where I know there's a generational um, difference. But I say that, and I'm going to pivot if that's okay. Do you have anything you want to add on? No, on I'm good. I say that, and then one of the artists that I hold in the highest regard, who is literally a hip-hop OG grandfather, puts Jeezy on his list, and that's Bun B. So back in 2009, uh, Bun B just said Pimp C, obviously his, his late uh, partner, Cool G Rap, Rick Royal, who's an artist that was from a group called Royal Flush that was signed to rap a lot. That sounds like a first favorite artist to me. Scarface and Jeezy. So again, I, I, these lists are great. Why are they great? Because I see that. I see Drake say it. I see Bun say it. All right, next road trip I'm taking, I might be listening to a little Jeezy. That one's a surprise to me. Um, and and in, in Bun's case, with the exception of G-Rap, these are all artists from the Below the Mason Dixon, Pimp, I assume Rick Royal and Face are all from Texas. Bun B is a Texas native too at Port Arthur. That's a really cool list. And, and you know, Bun B is often one of those living OGs, as is Scarface, that watched, you know, hip hop in the South from the 80s into today. So when he speaks, people listen. And do you know Rick Royal's music? I, I'd never heard of Rick Royal before. No, I want to, again, I want to seek that out because I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a rap a lot fan, but I see things like this and I realize I have work to do. Yeah, yeah, we all do, man. It's it's, yeah. it's that's the beautiful thing. It's it's a constant um, learning. So, Immortal Technique is next. Um, he's another guy who we want to include because he has an incredibly devoted fan base. Um, you know, uh, very controversial, very unafraid in terms of what he will say um, lyrically or you know otherwise. We don't have uh, him on the list, but, you know, Ice-T has told me on two different occasions that Immortal Technique and Prodigy were two of his favorite rappers. Ice-T doesn't have a definitive top five that I can find online, but when Ice-T, we've talked about a few times today, says that we absolutely need to include Immortal Tech. Yeah, interesting, interesting. So his list is Rakim, Kane, Karras, G-Rap, and Slick Rick, which is, you know, if 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 mortal if you told me a mortal technique started in the late '80s, that that's who I would have expected. Um, you know, so it's really interesting. Again, a guy who's gone back, paid homage to you know some of the earliest pioneers. You know, uh, we haven't heard Grandmaster Kaz mentioned and like uh, yeah, and and people like that. Um, but so I'd say the next wave and the wave that really established rap commercially on the radio and in terms of albums was this crew of Rakim Kane, KRS, Slick Rick. Um, and so it's cool to see him uh, give, give uh, homage to those, those forefathers. Most definitely. Now at the top of the podcast, we, so we need to include some, not, not need to, but it's, it's, it's noticeable that we didn't have any lists from women. And I, one of the things I found online was a conversation little Kim had had with all hip hop. And her list is not a tight five. It, it, it is sequenced, but I'll, I'll give it to you like this. 
starts with Biggie, you know, who very instrumental to her career, Jay-Z, who she worked with, Eminem, and then she has a tie of several artists, Rakim, KRS-One, Nas, Big Daddy Kane, Queen Latifah. It's dope that Kim gives it up to Queen La, I gotta say, we haven't seen her name yet. So that's a tie, that's five artists tying right there. And then for number five, she has Drake. Um, but it, that's important, you know, and, and, you know, I know Lil' Kim is a polarizing figure, you know, within, as an MC, but a lot of people consider just like the War Report, um, you know, many would argue that hardcore Kim's solo debut is is a classic or damn near. Yeah, this is, I got to say, one of the most diverse lists we've had. You know, she's got peers, predecessors, um, you know, a woman, uh, and then, then people who are after her too, like and Drake. So it's a really cool list. You know, I, I think it's one of the, the most interesting we've, we've done so far, just in terms of like diversity. Definitely. Definitely. So, you know, let's uh, let's give it up to one of the artists that we've heard a lot of mentions for today. G rap. Yeah. yeah cool. G rap has been, I think, one of the top names that we've heard so far. And so, you know, it's interesting to hear the list of a guy who's been so influential and meant so much to others. His is Melly Mel, you know, my first favorite. Big Daddy Kane, my third favorite. Rakim. KRS and Nas. And so, yeah, that's a really interesting list because, you know, obviously Nas owes so much of his style to Cool G Rap for him to salute Nas like that and say, yeah, young, young, young Buck, you took the torch and ran with it is, is really cool to see for me. The um, Melly Mel, you know, Cool G Rap, I don't think it's props enough as being a phenomenal storyteller. You know, um, records like Great T Train Robbery, um, you know, he is. And Melly Mel, to me, you know, people talk about Slick Rick, but Melly Mel is like, like the godfather of storytelling, the grandmaster, uh, you know, with the message and, you know, some of the other stuff that he's done. Uh, you got a thought? Yeah, I want to ask you a question about Melly Mel, since, you know, he was your first favorite. I mean, at that point, when you had made that decision, had you, was the message out yet or were you operating off of wax? Yeah, the, the message was out. Um, I was, I was uh, on the message, Beat Street survival, uh, World War III, um, New York, New York, Step Off, like all those records I can recite like by heart. You okay. know, Melly Mel was that guy for me and I got the chance to meet him. Uh, and we got a video of him too, talking about how he didn't think the message was actually gonna work. He didn't think the record was a great record and it was Sylvia Robinson who really pushed for it. Um, but. Yeah, Melly Mel was that guy for me. That was like, you know, mid 80s when I was first discovering hip hop and and growing up. Um, so yeah, he was he was that guy. And so yeah, it's cool to see G Rap name those guys. But anything else to stick out for you on that? No, yeah, the Nas thing on the Fast Life connection. And even though I think we all associate Large Professor and, and to some degree MC Search as Nas's mentor, you know, G Rap was the person that walked Nas into Def Jam. And I think Russell Simmons, it was passed on him. G Rap had history gone a little differently, could be, you know, as associated with Nas as Jazz O is with Jay-Z. But um, yeah, so speaking of Rakim, um, he has a definitive list too. And Rakim's is Grandmaster Melly Mel, Cool Modi, another, you know, deserving mention of that. The first time we see Grandmaster Kaz, and Kaz is somebody, you know, from the Cold Crush Brothers, Cold Crush 4, you know, never transit, never, tr his his legacy never translates to wax very well. But if you were in New York City or in the tri-state and got to see those parties at the time or can listen to the tapes, Kaz is a legend. When I was in college at Drexel University, Kaz and Busy B came through. And, you know, Kaz is one of the greatest orators and just demonstrators of not just emceeing, but DJing, production. I mean, he's a living, breathing, you know, pillar of this culture. So I love the fact that Rock Kim, one of the most trusted voices, you know, gives it up to Kaz. Um, yeah, I'll say ironically, uh, the his lyrics are translated best to wax. Like, are actually one of the is the seminal record of all time, and that's yeah. rapper's delight. You know, sure. a lot of people don't know that um, Big Bank Hank from the Sugar Hill Gang literally jacked Grandmaster Kaz for his rhymes. Um, he he starts off one of the verses. I'm the C A S A N O V A. The rest is F L Y. See, that is 
Grandmaster Cass, Casanova, Fly, you know, um, he literally took his rhymes word for word, put them on that beat, and it became one of the biggest rap records of all time. Grandmaster Cass received no money for it, or maybe he did later on in life, but he was jacked for years and got no recognition. But I, I would say that translated very, very well to Wax. Um, it's, a great, it's a great counterpoint, yeah. And, and Rakim added Eminem and Jay to his list. And then as a point of note, Rakim also said that Black Thought is the most underrated MC, which is really important. Yeah, you know, again. which we hear a lot. We hear that a lot. Um, I thought it was cool that Rakim, again, also talked about his predecessors and people who came after him. Mm -hmm. Giving it up to, to M and J is, is really cool. Um, so speaking of M, so Eminem has been on a lot of lists too. Um, and we mentioned Redman and him not coming up on uh, anyone's list. For Eminem, Redman is at the top. And he's consistently be at the, been at the top of um, Eminem's list. Eminem is unabashedly a fan. He talks about how much Redman influenced him, how much of his style is in his style. Uh, so it's cool to see those props. He's got Jay-Z, um, a peer and a competitor, a uh, friendly competitor, but Renegade is, I'd say, one of the, the most uh, hotly uh, debated records in terms of who had the best verse. And I'm sure they were both on each other's neck on that intentionally. Uh, Tupac, Biggie, Andre 3000, Jadakus, Corrupt, and Nas. And in that mm -hmm. order, that's his order. Uh, so I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, the three stacks, is, it, it, this is a really cool list, you know. So what do you, what do you think about it? I remember when this list came out. I mean, again, you have Jadakus here, which, I mean, shows that, again, Jada's not just living on an island when he believes he's that. Um, you have Eminem saying it. And then Corrupt, who we talked about before, Corrupt, I mean, suffers from being in a group, you know, the Dog Pound, even though, you know, they have one, you know, huge album and then a lot of independent stuff after it. It's great to see that acknowledgement. Um, M's list is super original. And again, I mean, from a Midwest guy that drew from both coasts around him, as well as the South with Andre, it, this list it always made a case for me of, of why, despite my hesitance, top five lists are really cool. Yeah, yeah. So next up is the one who sparked this entire conversation. You want, you want to talk about that? Yeah, Lil Wayne. Um, so, you know, Cube gave credit to him. Previously, KRS gave credit to him back in, I believe, May. Um, Wayne, you know, appearing on a show. And again, this is maybe why I kind of question irks me sometimes. You know, he's there and just casually they're like, oh, who's your top five? And, and Wayne really emphasized the point that he's talking about groups. When he mentions a group, he means everyone in them. So he says UGK, which is obviously Pimp C and Bun B. Goody Mob, this is the first time we've heard any of them. That's CeeLo, that's Big Gip, that's Cujo Goody, that's Timo. Um, and then you have Biggie and Jay-Z again, just frequent flyers on this list. And then somebody else, as we talk about women, Missy Elliott. And Wayne made it abundantly clear that Missy is the one for him. And that was a really cool answer, because when you look at just being animated, being really crazy in the videos, kind of defying human characteristics, Missy Elliott's been doing that. And she is a contemporary of Wayne. I mean, 1997 was probably when I heard both of them the first time, 96, 97, 98. So he's really giving it up. And I don't think they ever worked together. So, yeah, this is really, really interesting to me. He said of Missy. Uh, for me, it's always going to be first Missy Elliott. She's a huge influence of everything I've ever done. Um, mm. I can't say that I hear that influence, but, you know, in terms of conceptual and witty punchlines and things like that, you know, I, I, I can grasp it, you know. And then he says mm. of Jay-Z, who, you know, he and Wayne have also been in deep competition over the years. Because, uh, like I said, during that time when Jay took off, Wayne slid into that spot and, you know, Jay felt a way about that. And so he says of Jay, Jay-Z is the best to best ever to speak that's that's crazy that's you know wayne is saying about jay what cube said about wayne um mm -hmm. and then you know the other interesting thing to me is that you know we've heard andre 3000 mentioned one time a couple times um but for him to mention goody mob who i think a lot of people would put secondary to outcast i thought that was really fascinating too yeah i agree with you on that one um, so we have two artists left, and I want you to have the final word 
So I'll, I'll take the next one. He's somebody who's on my list and on yours, Jay-Z. Yep. And Jay's list is, is pretty simple. It's actually Biggie, Tupac, Scarface, Eminem, and yet again, Andre 3000. So I like the fact that at the top of the game, you're seeing Andre get these mentions, um, you know, time and again. And that's really important. And it also, one thing I want to add to the point of these lists changing, Jay had a slightly different list when he spoke to Charlie Rose in 2010, Biggie, Tupac, Cool G Rap, KRS-One, Nas, and Eminem. Um, and it was a few years ago, I think it was 2016, when Jay won, was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame and made a rare appearance on Twitter and just broke out everyone that had ever influenced him from, you know, uh, Playboy Cardi to AG of Showbiz and AG to Mac Miller to on and on and on. But I really, I really like this, this list. Um, Jay made huge records with Biggie, huge records with Scarface and Eminem, sort of like Wayne and Jay. I mean, actually much, much more vitriol. Pac was an adversary. So Jay can look through that and call Pac influential. Um, and then you've also got, you know, Andre 3000 on there. Oddly enough, just as a quick aside, no mentions of Big Boy, which I think is a travesty, not from Jay, but from anyone. He's somebody whose name we should be seeing. Yeah, and Jay has worked with all of these, except for, has he worked with Andre? I can't remember. I can't remember either. I don't think so. I, obviously, he didn't work with Pac, but there was a connection there. Yeah, we got to hear. Uh, 16, uh, um, no. Um, 16 he didn't work together like um uh, yeah i mean we got to get that jay-z uh, andre 3000 record i don't think there's jay and cool g rap ever has happened either um, yeah but you know obviously yeah. he gave g rap some great shouts in his lyrics but yeah yeah so, so i think it's stuff. a fitting and i'm sorry but you know for the godfather of hip-hop what is his take yeah, uh, last up is Cool Herc. So obviously not an artist, uh, but a DJ who is largely credited with starting this thing we love called hip hop. Um, his list was, uh, was very, very interesting, shall we say. It was Melly Mel, Karis One, Lil Wayne, Kanye West, and Chris Brown. That to me is like, fascinating um and i'm sure chris brown was wildly controversial uh i think this is around the time when look at me now came out and breezy was spitting on that um, 2015 yeah yeah and you know chris had done the mixtape with tyga um you know so chris has shown himself to be able to rap for sure kanye i'm sure is really interesting to people the thing i love about this list though is that hip-hop has been such a evolving art form you know it sounds completely different there's a um a history of rap series done by a dj collective called the rub and it goes from the 80s all the way into the 2010s and if you listen to it it's like completely different genres of music like um you know and if you think about little baby and um nba young boy and and you know all these guys playboy cardi these guys now compared to like uh you know like a grandmaster flash and furious five and a busy b ironically it's kind of come back around with more simplistic uh, cadences, um, but the, the melody, the auto-tune, the trap beats and things like that are completely different. Hip hop is a wildly varied um, uh, genre. And so I love seeing the guy who started it all embrace so many different styles. You know, Melly Mel is completely different than Wayne. KRS is completely different than Kanye. Chris Brown, most people would say is a singer. Um, primarily he is a singer. But if you think about, you know, a lot of the guys who are out now, uh, a lot of it is, sounds like singing. So I thought it was just a real cool way to close out with the guy who started it all and his list. Man, I agree. I agree. And, and that list, it, it still surprises me, but I like the way you broke that down of referencing, you know, a total cross section of, of hip hop. Um, so what are your big takeaways from this? Big takeaways are, I think that, um, the late 80s and early 90s uh, are the biggest influences overall. And uh, it's kind of two groups of people. You know, we talked about that. Um, I think there's been a fair amount of diversity in terms of uh, regional representation. I don't think the gender representation is there at all. Um, I only recall a couple of women being mentioned, Queen Latifah and Missy. Um, that to me is like really, really lacking and something I hope we can uh, improve upon and think about, you know, as we formulate our own top fives. 
Um, and yeah, man, that those are kind of my big takeaways. How about you? Yeah, I like that. And I think you start to see a little bit of, of, of sub, you see a little bit of regional pride, which isn't even necessarily that it's just like what you heard. Like if you grew up in LA, you're going to hear more Snoop Dogg than if you did in New York, or maybe just deeper cuts or more of a variety. If you're growing up in Texas or Atlanta, you might have a, you might have a different appreciation for some of the things and, and what their voice meant at the time that they said it. And I think it's really cool. And I mean, all told, it's just a total celebration of this thing that we love. And I do agree that, yeah, that, that 88 era and that like 94 to 96 era seems to really, there's a reason why those years keep coming up. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, yo, this has been a dope conversation. Um, hope, Everyone enjoyed it. If, again, if you if you like what you heard, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, as we always end, you got anything else you want to talk about before we get to song of the week? No, I, don't know. I like that. And you know, if you listen online, um, you know, please give us a rating. Hopefully, very positive. Give us a review. Spread the word. We appreciate this. This podcast is growing, and I, I love that, man. We've this is our we're we're well past the two year anniversary now, and. Um, this is something that's kind of turned into its own living, breathing thing, which is dope. For sure. For sure. So with that, what's your song of the week? Man, um, you know what? Apollo Brown, you know, who's an artist that's made some great albums with, uh, you know, some really important folks over the years, put out a new instrumental project. This must be the place. I got up at like 6 a.m. I was in Florida this week looking at the water and I just played it through like three times. And he has a joint on there called Catching Moments. And I keep coming back to that. So typically I try to, you know, I always try to make these, these songs hip hop. That's hip hop to me. It's just instrumental hip hop. So give it up to Apollo who we've had on the show. What about you? That's dope. That's dope. For me, uh, Brent Fires put uh, out a new album uh, called Wasteland. And he has a song called Wasting Time on it. Uh, and it's featuring Drake and the Neptunes. We actually have it on our playlist. It's a dope soul groove. Drake, spit he really he raps raps on it uh, which is great and i assume the neptunes produced it you know there's no like vocals or anything like that but you know pharrell has been in his bag lately again like that, i don't know when he hasn't been in his bag but with that and the joint he did with tyler the creator um you know he it, it's just great and it's a great reflection of like how that neptune's uh, sound has changed over time too so that's it for me. Yeah, man. Brent's turned into a superstar, man. I remember when he first burst on the scene and I was just looking at his numbers now. He is uh, one of the new stars. So that's yeah, great to see. Word. Great to see. Sure, well, man. I encourage anyone, you know, please, wherever you consume this, let us know your top five. I, we're not holding you to it. It could change tomorrow. But the discourse around this um, is what matters. It's not a gimmick to try to get, you know, people commenting. But uh, we always try to answer comments, the thoughtful ones. Um, keep this thing going, please. For sure. All right, man. Until the next time. Until we do it again. All, All right, right. y'all. Peace. Peace.